And we have to, one of the I think, things we have to understand is we have to go into issues at, at some depth, and I'm going to try to do that. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and I want to ask the question, is Mafege's notion, a uh, concept of the secular colonial state, with the idea it, it pervades of racist colonial institutions, still useful today? Um, Archie Mafege was a, a radical critic of colonialism, as well as of imported Western forms of radicalism. At the same time, he took a very critical view of African post-colonial states. And being a radical African anthropologist, he took popular <coughs> culture seriously and insisted on the centering of popular African experience in order to develop what Franz Fanon called new concepts for a new future. Okay? So I propose to follow him on this question also. I want to suggest that the continued relevance of his concept of the settler colonial state, not post settler colonial state, although I will modify it a little, I will modify it a little and propose the idea of the neo-colonial state, which I think is applicable to the continent as a whole in broad terms. It's actually very interesting. Yesterday I read an article in the uh, Business Day on Hendrik Fervoort, and it ends like this. Uh, I don't know if I can see this very well. Fervoort is not turning in his grave. South Africa remains a highly stratified and divided country. Violent enforcement is the order of the day. Things have not turned out exactly the way he wanted, but they are not so different either. So I think this is a very important point and an extremely hard uh, indictment of the state under which we live, but I think it's fundamentally correct. So I want to make a case of this, however briefly. So how are we to understand the relevance of this concept today? Perhaps we could begin by asking the question, how is it possible for a massacre like that at Marikana in 2012 to take place in a democratic state. Or to put it another way, what does democracy mean when workers are shot in cold blood rather than listened to? This is particularly problematic as state violence is not particularly exceptional in this country, although clearly not always on such a scale. After all, the idea of democracy suggests discussion and debate. Why is it? that the deployment of extreme violence by the state is seen as somehow legitimate. How can such a solution to what was fundamentally a labor dispute, and not a dastardly deed, as our current president noted at the time, enter the parameter of thought? In other words, how is it possible that this particular way of acting actually entered the parameters of thought and was, thought as, and, 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 and was seen as one of the possible options to deploy? And there's a problem, it seems to me, here, beyond the specifics of the situation. And this problem concerns how to understand state politics, both its institutions and its practices. And in order to make sense of this, and thus to begin to understand the state on the African continent, because I think this probably applies to the African continent as a whole, with, of course, national variations, I believe we need to begin by asking not so much which interest does the state represent, the common way of proceeding, but rather how does the state relate to the people under its rule? And it seems to me it should be quite clear who the state represents. I don't want to keep on going on about this, but I mean there's a bunch of statistics, including the most obvious one, which is the, you know, according to the Gini coefficient, South Africa has, was, has been the most uh, unequal country in the whole world over a number of years. Huh? It doesn't start with Zuma, this problem of inequality and poverty. It was there long before. And there is evidence to suggest that the income share of the top 1% in South Africa has nearly doubled since the early 1990s. Okay? And this is from the French economist Thomas Piketty. Now, it seems to me that if the state defends the interests of a small minority, how does it rule its population? That really needs to, the question really needs to be asked. How can it still call itself democratic in all seriousness when in South Africa around half the population by all accounts live below the poverty line? And I think we can begin to answer this question if we look at the different ways, as I said, in which the state power rules different parts of its population. 
These different modes of rule become particularly apparent at moments of rebellion, when people contest that mode of rule. Now, I have argued at length elsewhere that there are three distinct and often overlapping modes of state rule in Africa, present to various extents in every country. Each of these modes of rule produces three distinct domains or spheres of politics which are characterized by distinct ways of thinking, social and political problems, reactions to them by various political actors, and thereby producing a limited context of what constitute legitimate or illegitimate ways of posing problems and solutions to them. Rarely do popular reactions to state rule contest these limits themselves, but it does happen. This is when the oppressive characteristics of these state-induced domains of politics, or spheres of politics, whatever you want to call them, become more apparent. I just want to give a brief description of two of these modes of rule. The third one, I won't have time, obviously. Um, and their attendant domains, and then draw attention to some of the ways in which they have been briefly contested in South Africa in recent years. Fundamentally, I wish to suggest that what makes the African state neo-colonial is not exclusively its, subserv its subservience to foreign economic interests, but rather the fact that through its subservience to foreign capital in general, and finance capital in particular, it considers the majority of its people as the potential enemy, with the result that they must be ruled through the deployment of systemic violence. Indeed, it is arguably the rule of violence against the people that makes subservience to foreign capital possible. If you doubt this, um, just think about the two factions that are currently fighting at the moment, both within the ANC and the state, over different forms of accumulation. One of them wanting to control the state in order to enable its own accumulation, and the other one being subservient to the rules of foreign finance capital um, in order to continue with its accumulation. Huh? Um, I think we need to think more, think seriously about these two factions. But the point of the matter is that this is an inter-elite struggle. It doesn't really <coughs> involve or benefit the overwhelming majority of the population. So, the first... Um, uh, 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 okay, so how, is it, um, so how is it possible for the state to call itself democratic when a massive slaughter such as that of Marikana can take place in 2012? In fact, democracy was not the term used by the miners to describe their experience of the state. They were themselves, they saw themselves as excluded. For example, and I quote, we, as mine workers, are excluded from this democracy, end of quote, they say. So they are not alone, as people like Abahari Basen Jondolo uh, repeat endlessly. Void violence against the poor is endemic in the life experience of the majority. It is a regular phenomenon to which many are oblivious. In order to make sense of this issue, a state democracy for some and systemic violence for others. It is my contention that we must understand the state's action, that the state's actions are governed by different modes of rule, which are subjective in essence. So let's just, let me just try and say a few things about what I see as these domains of rule. There are three uh, which I see as existing all over Africa. The first one is civil society, the second one I call uncivil society, and the third one traditional society. I don't want to talk much about traditional society due to constraints of time. Um, so let me focus on the first two, civil society. Civil society is seen as the domain of freedom for the liberal democratic state. It, no, it must not be understood as referring simply to organized interests themselves, but to the domain in which these interests organize and operate. This is in fact a general agreement among the classic political theorists. The rights-bearing citizen is the constituent body of this domain. The relations between state and the people in this domain are governed by a relation of citizenship. State politics regularly follows the rule of law, and violence is only deployed as a last resort. Collective organizations, often confused with civil society itself, as I just mentioned, are recognized as, as legitimate interlocutors by the state. Common term is stakeholders. 
Usually, state agencies and institutions follow the state's own rules. Arbitrariness is restricted to a minimum. Occurrences of arbitrariness are amplified by the media, of course. And the right of redress is guaranteed. We can say, following Hannah Arendt, that here the, the people possess the right to rights. As Pata Chatterjee says, uh, and he puts it, these are the rights of property owners. This is the core discourse of classic liberalism, as Domenico Lusudo has shown at length. Yet, in the same way as in the 17th and 18th centuries, such liberal freedoms for some were accompanied by the practices of slavery and colonialism, so today, and racism, so today, a sacred sphere of liberal freedom is still accompanied by a profane domain of open freedom. We should also note that in the case of South Africa, the state was only superficially democratized through an inclusive constitution founded on liberal precepts and a Bill of Rights. In fact, what arguably happened was that after 1990, a new small black middle class was incorporated into the civil society that had already existed for whites under the apartheid state. The state itself, its institutions and practices, with the exception of the upper echelons of the judiciary, was not democratized. What this means is that in many of its features, the domain of civil society in South Africa is overwhelmingly white, both numerically, whites are over overwhelmingly the main active citizens, and culturally, Western conceptions of liberal democracy are hegemonic. In fact, a politics of whiteness, racism in various forms, still governs civil society. Overall, the intellectual debates in civil society are limited by the idea of citizenship. The distinction between active and passive citizens, forms of citizenship, degrees of citizenship, and so on. The media constantly, uh, uh, sorry, what am I um, The media constantly exhorts its listeners to and to know their rights and use them responsibly. The practices of uncivil society protests, e.g., burning of tires, stone throwing, and collective punishment of community members deemed to have engaged in criminal activities are frowned upon in civil society, both by state and people. Civil society is thus the proof of the existence of a liberal democratic state. In authoritarian liberal states, civil society is either non-existent or minimal in its extent. The state can therefore use its existence to prove, in inverted commas, its democratic credentials. Yet only a minority of the population is ruled in this manner. This minority is primarily urban and middle class, and living outside the overwhelmingly black urban areas left over from apartheid segregation, called townships, which can also possess multi-class populations. So civil society is not the unique domain of politics in neo-colonial state. As I shall argue, this is precisely the reason why these states can be termed neo-colonial. Liberal democratic norms are only applicable to some, a minority that is not identifiable uniquely in class terms. Other modes of rule are on operation systematically, and these in fact show that human rights and citizen discourses are not the dominant subjectivities at play, although they may be in existence in the subordinate law. So let me just talk about uncivil society. I call it uncivil because of the Hlalish, my Basen John Lolo, referred to unfreedom. So it doesn't mean uncivilized. It simply uh, um, relies on their concept of unfreedom. Uncivil society that predominates in urban areas primarily as a political domain outside civil society and the purview of its rules is not regulated by a relation of citizenship and human rights. Rather, within this sphere, people do not possess the right to rights. It is not that they don't possess rights, they don't possess the right to rights. Because people ruled in uncivil society do not have the right to rights, they are ruled only occasionally according to legal precepts. In fact, the rule of law does not prevail quite frequently within this domain, and regulations, rule, and rights differ according to a historically developed distinct culture of politics and are frequently enforced by popular justice. In fact, because of the absence of the rule of law, arbitrariness persists, 
strong land control, access to resources, and patronage relations are prevalent. This is not unique to South Africa. As a result, violence has become a legitimate way of resolving political problems, whether this be housing problems, unemployment, access to official documents, market competition between businesses, or what have you, or, and I should add, competition between members of the ANC to see which one is going to be gaining uh, access to resources. The inter-ANC killing in Natal and other places is notorious. So, moreover, if rights discourse is often considered, moreover, human rights discourse, sorry, is often considered a threat to the dominance of patriarchy and national entitlements. Hence, the frequent uh, display of, of, of xenophobic violence. In South Africa, at least people in our civil society are also cognizant of their entitlement to the delivery of services by the state and protest often violently when these are not satisfied. The promise to satisfy these entitlements is also what enables the powerful local politicians and power brokers to set up patronage relations within our civil society. In this domain, as noted, the rule of law is largely, but not always, absent, and ethnic politics, patronage relations and violence can develop as part of everyday life, while people are supposed to bear this oppression and coercion in silence. So it is within this domain that a so-called culture of violence can be most easily established, although to call it a culture can suggest an ingrained transgenerational subjectivity that is largely unchangeable in its essence, a flawed assumption, as this culture is systematically produced and can be restricted through struggle. At times, violence spills over into civil society itself, and only then is it noticed by the mass media, for example. Otherwise, the state ensures that it remains contained and beyond civil experience. The origins of uncivil society are clearly colonial, as Pati Pata Chakajik has recognized. He refers to it as political society. But in neo-colonial society, such a mode of rule is neither specific to ethnicity, race, nationality, or even class, although its essence is still colonially derived. It is irreducible to socio-economic characteristics or social location, and is not simply historically determined. At the same time, although distinct to such an extent that they can be said to constitute unique subjective worlds, these two domains of state politics, civil and uncivil society, and their defining modes of rule are interconnected, as it is on the state politics of uncivil society that the pyramidal edifice of the political oligarchy is ultimately founded a feature that illustrates the neo-colonial character of African states. These two modes of rule cannot be grasped as simply inherited from the past. They have previously existed as tendencies only, and were even superseded to a certain extent and for a limited time during periods of mass upsurge, such as in the 1980s in South Africa. What is important is that these distinctive ways of thinking politics which are mostly incomprehensible to each other, can be transcended and unified, but only through struggle, of course. So, whereas human rights discourse is helpful for organizing in civil society, as it creates legal space for NGOs and social movements, in uncivil society, human rights are frequently blamed for the collapse of parental authority, for the apparent sexual freedom of women, and for the perceived threats by outsiders or foreigners to community entitlements. There is also increasing evidence that the police themselves act more as the personal agents of municipal councillors, people with power in the local community, than as upholders of the law. And that their preferred modus operandi is one of terrorising the poor while avoiding any open confrontation with organised criminal gangs. In their 2007 report on local politics in the Durban area, Mark Butler and Richard Pittas note, the evidence permits only one interpretation. The local state acts in a systematically criminal manner towards its poorest residents on the assumption that this behavior is within the norms of a shared social consensus amongst the social forces and institutions that count. I'll stop there. On Human Rights Day in 2018, about last year, a few, last year exactly, 
human rights, uh, Basim Jondolo stated, Today is supposed to be Human Rights Day, on which we celebrate the achievement of human rights for all. The human rights written into the laws only exist on paper for people who are black and impoverished. In reality, we are impoverished, our homes are destroyed, we are beaten, shot at, tortured, jailed and killed. Today we are supposed to be celebrating the sacrifices made by many fallen heroes of our country. But the reality is that the AC government has decided to continue with the apartheid state finished. We continue to be oppressed. Okay, I just want to end um, uh, uh, by saying a few words about how, um, how uh, these various domains become, or the modes of ruling these two domains, become more apparent during periods of, or moments of upsurge and struggle. Um, I don't have time to talk about Marikana, but I want to mention something about, the, because they were mentioned earlier, the student protests of 2015-2016, which I happened to uh, experience at first hand because I was then at uh, Rhodes University, now, well, I'm still Rhodes University. Uh, in <laughs> now, Marikana. Um, so, the, 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 the student protests in 2015-16 illustrate the difference between civil and civil society politics and modes of rule. At Rhodes University in Grahamstown, where I was located for four years, there were three distinct phases to these protests, each with its own specific features. The first, known as the Rhodes Must Fall, or Black Student Movement, was primarily a graduate student movement, which contested the whiteness of civil society and its enforced assimilation for young black people. Animated by frustrations with the university culture, which was overwhelmingly white, colonial, patronizing, racist, and human rights and NGO oriented, this movement contested the inadequacies of what was considered exclusion by a colonial institutional culture that alienated what had become a majority of black students who did not feel they belonged. Taking part towards the end of 2015, <coughs> this movement was followed by an undergraduate dominated fees must fall movement overlapping with an anti rape culture movement during 2016. There has been an important high court judgment emanating as a result of the last movement, the anti rape movement, that brings out clearly the contradictions between resistance in civil and uncivil societies. Grandstown today, Makanda is a very small colonial town where modes of rule based on rights and those based on popular justice exist side by side, spatially divided between white suburbs and black townships. Given that the majority of students at Rhodes University are now black and yet inhabit a white space, contradictory political practices can come to the fore. So this can be seen in this judgment handed down by the Grandstown High Court. Somehow, I don't think they changed the name. In 2016, the case concerned events that happened during protests against rape culture and gender violence on campus. For those of you who don't know, campus is in fact a physical continuation of town and is not separated from it without any barrier. Two young men accused of being rapists were dragged out of their residences and surrounded in the street below by a group of angry young women students who it seems had held them against their will, abused them verbally, but did not harm them physically. The action unfortunately counted as kidnapping in law. Further, it was alleged <coughs> that one of the students had told the resident, residence warden, who had attempted to restrict the kidnapping, that had he been in a township, he would have been burnt alive. The judge, who was judging on this issue, and because the university took these students to court, the judge stated that, quote, it must be accepted on the common cause facts in this matter that the protests went beyond the boundaries of peaceful and non-violent action, at least in respect of kidnapping, unlawful barricading of entrances, and damage to university property, even if limited in extent, end of quote. The actions of the students were thus seen as an infringement of rights so that students' actions, including kidnapping, were seen as unlawful activities, while the warden had been intimidated when a crowd of protesters 
forced their way into his residence and, quote, uttered words which were perceived as a threat by the warden, end of quote. Independently of the verdict, the point that needs to be made is that the events, the kidnapping and threats uttered are not out of the ordinary within a civil society. Students acted the way they did because they felt the university authorities and the criminal justice system was not adequately dealing with gender oppression, and in a sense, they took the law into their own hands, which is precisely what frequently happens in townships, where the rule of law is inoperative and where the right to rights does not exist, as I said earlier. In this context, the intervention of the court can easily be seen as an external colonial one. The democratization of uncivil society cannot take place from outside, but only by the kind of practices internal to it, some of which Abakhlavi proposed. It is not a matter of moralizing here, but simply of noting the existence of different rules governing distinct worlds distinguished by different modes of state rule. The court simply stated what the law was in civil society. It is only able to apply a discourse of rights to a context where rights do not prevail, or at least are not regularly invoked, thus in a sense underlining the distinction that prevail between distinct modes of rule and domains or cultures or political redress in this case. So in sum, as illustrated, by this case, the different modes of rule in existence allow for the possibility of conceiving the state, in this case the examples come from South Africa, as apparently democratic for those living within civil society, but fundamentally colonial for the majority. The kind of state practices this enables and legitimizes reproduce a systemic form of authoritarianism which threatens at any time to enter the hallowed ground of civil society in its sacred space of freedom. Thank you very much. Um, 
But I, I, I think anybody familiar with Keanu's work um, will know that there is a significant difference between Keanu's work, um, Miyono, Gosfogo, and Maldonado Torres. Um, Keanu, in the Latin American context, is your classical right wing, left wing, yeah, you know, a, 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 a theorist, um, rather than um, a, a post-structuralist, critical theory, uh, we call it a, a, a person. And, and I don't remember ever really use the word decoloniality. The significance of that, um, perhaps for the younger generation, um, is that the tendency to collapse all forms of imperialist, uh, what do you call it, uh, domination, into a single notion of coloniality, whether you're talking about power matrix or coloniality or being even worse, uh, undermines the specificity of direct colonial rule. And much like it's easier for younger South Africans to talk about um, Almost you get a, a crazy notion of, oh, things were better in the apartheid period. Um, um, that's because you never lived in it. Okay? Uh, and, I, and I think, you know, uh, because, because, you know, a collapsing of this nature doesn't allow us, and the concept of imperialism is absent from the colonial discourse. Um, and it undermines the specificity of colonial rule and the crudest forms of subversion of imperial negation of the right to self-determination. Political independence for the generation that was involved in anti-colonial struggle was understood. This was not just a Kwame Nkrumah thing, uh, although in a few weeks I'll talk more specifically about that. Um, which where you find it, this, this very crude gross misrepresentation which was initiated by Adam Azouli in 1966 of, uh, of uh, what Nkrumah actually meant when he says he was the political leader. Uh, that political independence as a prerequisite to undoing all other forms of imperial domination was not simply a claim exclusive to Nkrumah, it underpinned the essence of the anti-colonial struggle. Uh, Reposite for economic, for social, for epistemic decolonization, which I don't think is the same thing as the coloniality. The discourse also underestimates the achievement, and I'll put it this way, achievement of post-colonial Africa in economic, social, and epistemic terms without underestimating the persistence of imperialism as a form of global domination, something that Colin refers to as new colonialism. So let me give a very personal biological, biographical experience. My education in Western Nigeria, okay, an education that was I'm able to say a seamless continuation of what I learned on the knees of my grandmother. My primary school education involved Yoruba, what you call it, mythology, language, and, and so on and so forth. Of chemistry that celebrated and validated, validated the pharmacological insights of traditional fact, medicinal therapies. Um, the efforts to derive sociological insight from Ifa oracular text and Ifa here is the kind of religious, you know, traditional religious thing, which extended to computer science, mathematics, and so on and so forth, and this and that. And to learn African history at the feet of Adia Jai or Om Kadiki. All this would have been impossible in British colonial Nigeria. The important point is to confront the significant failings of decolonization, a decolonization project, without vitiating its sources. And I think one can look at this, you know, what we just, just to drag in action, you know, uh, 
and after all, this is about the celebration of the intellectuals. Um, it, 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 I will look at two, 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 two areas. One of these interventions of, on, the, on the idea of neocolonialism and on state capitalism. Um, I think what was quite important, I mean, I think we use neocolonialism uh, well, sometimes very loosely. Um, if you read to Uman, for instance, he actually didn't think that what he was writing applied to Ghana on that year. But what is important, which stretches to interpret this course also, and which actually emphasizes is the question of agency. Or colonial, or, or, or anti-colonial movement and post-colonial environment it was to put square the responsibility on Africans and the way in which we manage and deal with our, 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 our context. And the agency is also for that. Against the tendency to flatten the African political landscape, for instance, there are in fact tremendous variations. Okay? Um, and I've, I've had very loose talks about, you know, Mobutu. Uh, Mobutu was not an African leader, okay? Um, it was important that you have to kill Patrice Lumumba before you could install Mobutu, okay? Uh, John Pedro Bokassa was not, okay? This is, you know, what you call it, uh, 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 you know, uh, and so on and so forth. And the question of agency is particularly important in understand the complexities of, of you know, the, the, the post-colonial project and the way in which it, it, it manifests itself. Perhaps what was also quite important in terms of the macro level um, uh, you know, economic project of trying to undo the political, the colonial political economy, which you know wasn't you know, a, a crisis as long as you go to the end of the 70s with the Lagos manufacturing, which was an aborted a structural adjustment. And I think you know, there's a tendency, if you were to follow the debate in, in Tanzania, for instance, uh, some of our, uh, ISA, for instance, we talk about bureaucratic bourgeoisie and things like that. And I've, I've explained to him that it's neither Marxist, particularly mm -hmm. radical. Um, you, can't, you can't talk about the bureaucratic bourgeoisie in the classical Marxist sense. It does not own property, okay? Um, and I think the point that actually makes in relation to that to that debate is to understand state capitalism as a double-edged sword. Okay? Insofar as accumulation involves the suppression of wages and consumption, for instance, it involves the exploitation of workers. Insofar as it involves the appropriation of peasants' surplus, it exploits the countryside. I'm, I'm, I'm quoting actually. At the same time, State capitalism functions as a defense against external predation. To quote Archie, the partial negation of the law of private property, the nationalizing of land by the state, is a partial negation of the laws of finance capital and their determination. End of quote. Insofar as it establishes the economies of scales in production process, it contributes towards the development of the working class. And to quote again, it represents a partial negation of labor power as a commodity. Now, all this, of course, depends on whether state capitalism itself facilitates or creates a blockage to private accumulation. Mwalimu, for instance, will be less than it is in Tanzania, what they call the leadership code that was put in place that prevented leaders from you know, accumulation and things like that. In places like Kenya and Nigeria, for instance, state capitalism was important in the what you call it, uh, uh, development of, of, of the domestic proto bourgeois class and so on and so forth. I would probably argue, as to this as well, that is, it's also a function of how the surplus accumulated is disposed that becomes quite important. Um, the question of what do you call it? Uh, 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 you know, human subjectivity is there, but the way whether you're dealing with you know, uh, you know material or, or, or subjective evaluation uh, becomes important. But but that that how you how how you dispose of surplus accumulation becomes important 
and where, for instance, it's about economic expansion and the financing of social investments in citizens, which happen in many of uh, their own uh, countries, for instance. Um, it's it, it, it functioning differently when it, it, it goes to underpin private accumulation. I will come back to that in our because I think it's important. The paradox, of course, of this debate is that by the time we go to the post, what do you call it, uh, to the post, what the neoliberal context, the paradox on the African continent was that in fact the countries that use state capitalism, and this is not, this is not an endorsement, that use state capitalism to develop proto bourgeois classes in their own context were the ones who are more able to resist foreign capital encroachment. Kenya, Nigeria, and so on and so forth. So take, for instance, the fight between Kenyan bureaus and SAB. Let's say what became SAB Miller. Okay? Uh, Kenyan bureaus was able to resist the encroachment of, of uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, SAB Miller. And, and the resolution is go across to Tanzania. And essentially, SAB Miller was not carrying on up at this time. Uh, the worst example is, of course, what you saw in the case of, of Zambia, uh, where uh, under Chinuba, for instance, state asset was, was a fire sale. Um, and you're getting a situation now where the, the mode of politics, and I'll come to that later, the mode of politics is actually maneuvers around the neoliberal norms, uh, depending on who is, uh, you know, the whole idea of the renationalization of, of the mind in, in Zambia, for instance. Is completely absurd. But I think it's also <coughs> important to deal with, and what I call the pre and post 1980 situation, on what I call neoliberalism and your making of the post colonial nationalist project. I use nationalism in, in code because I'm, I'm quite uncomfortable with the concept um, in that it's it's part of the crisis of our own, I think, in what it was, the first to invent. Concept and category that more relevant to us. The nationalist project was not nationalist. It was not about what we call it, constituting uh, ethno cultural linguistic categories. In fact, if anything, uh, the, most, the most progressive so called nationalist movements uh, were pan pan ethnic, you know, pan you know, national. Um, and what I believe in the and actually, we we'll probably disagree here, especially towards this last writing uh, on the national portion of South Africa. Um, uh, 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 but the, the, the point there is, 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 is quite good. And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I use it, it's a, a number of slides here uh, to, to indicate, to just point at the need to read this history um, you know, and to understand how, in fact, some of the issues that, 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 that uh, Mike you know, uh, pointed to, some of the things that we see in the Bible, for instance, that needs to be understood as the exacerbation of the crisis of the state on a new project. Okay? So if you want to take two set of indicators, I said, I'll talk about macro level, set of indicators, for instance, and this and that. You look at undoing the colonial colonial uh, political economy uh, is, is not simply growth of the economy or structural transformation. An indicator of structural transformation of an economy is the share of manufacturing in your GDP. Okay? What the, 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 the first uh, what it demonstrate, the first sum here demonstrate, is this is 1916, this is 19, um, uh, and, and, and this is the trend line. And, uh, Use. And, and you can see uh, this period is the what you call it, oil shock in your price cycle. But if you are taking between this period and so on and so forth, for instance, uh, manufacturing as a share of, of GDP grew from, from about 6% uh, to about 13% in 1982. Then you have the what you call it, uh, what you call it structural adjustment, neoliberal integration, and so on and so forth. And what we saw there has been essentially a decline. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, here, yeah, if you talk in terms of what you call it, uh, mobilizing resources for your what you call it, development projects, social, economic, and so on and so forth, for instance, gross domestic 
uh, saving for instance, which is accumulation, uh, what do you call it, uh, which diverts into gross domestic, becomes quite important. And I give you what do you call it, gross domestic saving as a, a share percentage of your GDP becomes quite important. Again, we can see this from about 20, a little bit to about 20% of GDP uh, to about 25% in 1980, and then it collapsed. Um, um, this, for instance, gives you this is this is sub Saharan Africa minus South Africa, and this is South Africa, and we we'll see exactly the same trend uh, of, 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 of the trend. Um, and it, and, it, and it's, 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 it's particularly important because the fiscal basis of the state was undermined as part of the new project and, and so on and so forth. South Africa might not have gone through structural adjustments, but in economic terms, there's greater continuity between 1990 and, and post-1994 than, than this continuity. Uh, 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 on the other hand, if you look at what do you call it, uh, uh, domestic savings in the East Asia and Pacific region, for instance, this is this is the trend uh, that, that you, you, you experience. Perhaps, if you deal with that at the economic level, when you deal with what will impact on individuals, uh, you know, for instance, um, in a way, GDP per capita is a very crude. It's not because it doesn't take into consideration inequality and so on and so forth. But what is quite important is the significant difference between pre-1980 growth pattern and post-1980 growth pattern. First of all, you have this curious issue. Right? Uh, in which there's a growth in, what do you call it, what do you call it, per capita GDP uh, between 1960 and 1980, for instance. And other structural instruments collapsed for that new something. And then there was a recovery, what is the Africa rising, mm -hmm. you know, Africa in Majon, on its own Majon, and this and that. You know, mm -hmm. and the, the paradox of it is what I refer to here as the declining poverty elasticity of growth. In other words, the extent to which poverty responds to growth, which has to do with fundamental change in the structure of the economy, such that even when there is this recovery, there's an increase in poverty. So that the, 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 the number, the number of people in poverty, for instance, rose from 329 million, and I'm using $2.50. Not, not your not your work with one dollar and which is really quite an insult, you know, because that's that's understood as destitution. Uh, as I said a few years ago at a, at a keynote lecture at uh, the UN in, in New York, uh, my calculation, I was still living in Brampton at the time was like to buy you a loaf of bread and a bottle of water. And I asked the question, is this the image you have know, Because if you're able to reach that uh, one dollar twenty-five then you go one dollar ninety. Uh, it's a loaf of bread and a bottle of water, but the person is still naked, homeless. And, and I said poverty will decline at the end of August because most of the poor will have died of hypothermia. Mm. You know. and, 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 and I think this, this, is, this is particular important. So let me, you know, because it's important to take this into context in terms of what is in essentially. The pessimism of a new generation of Africans <coughs> whose only experience of the continent is the post-1980. Okay? Um, and, 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 and then to raise the question, for instance, of, of when we talk about post-settler uh, states in, in, in the what do you call it, uh, in, in, in South African uh, context. And I, and I would, I would like to, to, to raise the issue in terms of what I call the outsource state. About the way in which what does not seem to enter our debate. Uh, we talk about corruption and this and that, you know, AS is corrupt and this AS is this and that. I'll pick three examples of what I call the fundamental, what do you call it, the outsource state. Because underpinning the neoliberal project is that the state must not do what the private sector can do. Now, you have to take the resource away from the state. The resource away from the state is there. So what do you do? State function that the state used to carry out on its own must now be handed over to the private sector. Okay? There's a logic to this thing. 
And it's not used blaming ANC, blaming something. Because what I'll pick here, I'll pick one that is not ANC control and pick two on that DA control. And the logic is the same thing. So take for instance one of the things that developed in, in, in global business strategy is what is called bottom of the pyramid. <coughs> Basically the argument is that there's money to build out of the poor. Okay? There's money to build out of the poor. The most dramatic example of that is Met One, Cash Pay Master, and the Department of Social Development. But it's a narrative that I've had black South Africans, business people, say already. Money to make among the poor. And, and what is it that's what you call it? So what do you do? And think about it. Uh, because in 2002, I was at a meeting here in Pretoria, it's coming from East London. And that weekend, three old people had died in the Williams family while they were waiting to collect their social grants. Okay? While they were waiting to collect their social grants. And I asked at the meeting, I mean, my first bank account that my grandmother got for me was a post office bank account. Why is it not possible to distribute this money through the post office? Alright? But the whole idea, the culture, and this is not an ANC thing. That's why I say ANC came into something. The transition happened at the wrong time in history. Okay? The economic macroeconomic which has implications for the way the state treats its citizens. And so on and so forth. But the PD language, for instance, comes out as better service for people, but its citizens as clients. Okay? And what you had here was a situation where you, you found out. And the whole argument, remember, Constitution Court ruling was because the, the company that lost the bid challenged it in court. It wasn't for, what do you call it, for, uh, what do you call it, some, um, you know, I love the poor reason and this and that. That was the thing. And all the concern, including the statement issued by a committee on which I sit on ASAF, was about, oh, you know, you're not know, you know, going to get about Nobody raised the question, why the hell is net one or any other person distributing social grants? And what it turned out was that, in fact, net one was, was, was then using that database, which is going to happen to all of us, as our database is handed over to the banks to issue ID cards and, uh, and, uh, and, and passports, we're going to get into the same situation. Okay? And it was a situation where Net, Net, Net One set up financial services for the poor. So you are on social grants and, and they have your database and then they, and people say, no, but I didn't sign up for this. And so money is taken away from 380, right? From 1,400 and so on and so forth. All the debate we had was not so much as to why is it that you have a private sector company, a business something, running social grants in that you know, world. And all the concern was about, about corruption in the ASC and so on and so forth, rather than the underpinning logic, for instance. The interesting thing about this is that, in fact, the tender that was awarded to post office still followed the same logic. Rather than post office as, as a public institution rendering public service. Okay? And, and, I, and there are alternative models for this. An example of the other example, which is the here on uh, something, my own, uh, what do you call it, municipality, is the one that grew up in the area, what do you call it, Glad Africa contract. What was the basis of the Glad Africa something? The Auditor General came up with a report that says, Joining municipality, given the size and the complexity of the works that have been done, does not have a project management office. All right. So, what did the people in the municipality do? Uh, appointed that for them. Twelve billion over the group of something for it. By the time it was spent, it was already paid four hundred million. Uh, when you it by as of February of 2019, and so on and so forth. All the debate was concerned with, all the debate was concerned with was the tender procedure. There was no point at which an alternative model was considered. Very simple. You have a municipality. It doesn't have a project management office, where you set up a project management office. So if you are to appoint 15 engineers of various grades, and so on and so forth, my calculation is that, uh, 
at an estimated cost, cost to employer now of 15 engineers at average of 800,000 per annum is 12 million a year. Uh, equipment office support staff at 75% of the HR cost, cost to employer of the engineer, for instance, total cost in the first year will be 21 million. Okay? Uh, less costly to the fixed cost than the 400 million that was paid in the first two years to a private company and 12 billion on which this thing was estimated, you know, and so on and so on. And you can extend it to SCD Mini. Uh, SCD Mini, uh, it's about the collapse, deliberate collapse, deliberate collapse as part of the new liberal logic, deliberate collapse of the capacity of the state to run state health institutions, mental institutions. And a situation where private providers of healthcare that grew between 1998 and 2002 have already taken over the whole So you give what you call it contract to them to take over the functions of the state, and then they become price takers. They dictate prices to the government. And when the government then says, no, but you're charging too much, then you have all this briefcase. What do you call it? Black empowerment, uh, something. We know something. They know. No, at no time in the SCD meeting something did it enter the debate. Why is it that the state cannot run its own, which is to have in holiday and so on and so forth, its own health, mental health institution? And you see the, the kind of attack over the NHL. Alright? And, 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 and so on and so forth. And, and then, of course, you can't say anything and not talk about this come these days. But this is, this is, this is uh, what it is, day maverick. All right. Tomorrow, for instance, Moody is supposed to issue uh, something. The whole concern here, all right, and, and, and uh, what you call it? Uh, it's what I call neoliberalism class warfare. Okay. Um, um, the whole idea, the whole concern here is what Moody is going to say. What about citizens? And what was the thing that created this part of the thing? Apart from the, what do you call it, uh, the, the, uh, the storm in Mozambique and so on and so forth, was that the, the maintenance contract, they were talking about pipes and bolts and so on, the maintenance contract was, you know, fell, what do you call it, lapsed and it was not renewed. Mm -hmm. What the heck is ESCOM giving its maintenance out on a contract? And then of course you have the whole thing where actually a significant proportion of former members of, you know, it's not a black, white thing, okay? Former members, staff of, of ESCOM move out, set up their own business to provide services they used to do instead of ESCOM to ESCOM now or so on. It's a fundamental thing about the neoliberal logic of underpinning this thing. And it's no use, you know, screaming about corruption and this and that. I always say this in Nigeria and this and that. When you say, when you retrain the state's capacity to provide education, to provide health care, to provide, you know, infrastructure, and you say, no, this is what so citizens must do, and the resources available to the state has not diminished, what do you think is going to happen? No, what do you think is going to happen? Okay? provide all these services, they are money available for discretionary investment with the client, okay? And then, Cape Town, all right? It's a very simple one. This is Rodney Bosch Golf Club, which leases from the city of Cape Town 450,000 square meters of land. You know how much it pays for the 450,000 square meters? 1,000 rent per month. 450,000 square meters. It pays 1,000 rent a month. It pays 12,000 rent a month a year for the land. Its golf club annual membership fee is 15,750. To pay, play one hour of uh, what do you call it, golf something at off peak time is one hundred fifty rand. And I'm not hearing any screaming. 
don't have to exist. No, 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 no. I mean, because, okay, all right. Let me just end then. And I think this, this is uh, what I call politics in the now and the future. I think it's what, what, what happened over this period, and it doesn't matter whether you're in Zambia or you're in South Africa or you're in Zimbabwe, all right, uh, or Kenya. Essentially, what you have is politics has become an alternative maneuvering around the new liberal norms. If your citizens are, what do you call it? Uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, somebody said uh, uh, now that the government has lost confidence in the people, it would it not be better for the government to dissolve the people and elect a new one? <laughs> okay? If you are unclear, if you are unclear economy, for instance, you have no need for the people. Your fiscal does not depend on your people. You have to be a mature state for that to happen as well as well. And increasingly, you know, I, 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 you see that. So that there's little policy alternative between the governing party and the opposition. In fact, I think the interesting thing in South Africa is that the DA has to betray his classical liberalism, what do you call it, uh, 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 roots. Uh, to have any sense of power and, and, and coaching. So now you hear a dear lady, a man like, are we? Okay? No, 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 you know. And, and what you have here, what I've developed about something, is what I what you call the disempowerment, what I'm going to really refer to as the disempowerment of new democracy. It becomes quite important, something that has spread all over the continent across the globe, is that key economic decision making institutions are removed from democratic oversight. Alright? Let's take a very simple one. This idea of the independence of your central bank is a post 1980 phenomenon. Okay? Which is being defended as an article of faith now. Because it's in the constitution, the constitution will celebrate, but it's a constitution that is a liberal constitution. One of the things that affect most people more in terms of borrowing and so on and so forth is the interest rate. Who gets to determine the interest rate? It's monetary policy committee. Do you know who the members are? Does anybody here know who the members of the committee are? Yesterday in Nigeria, the central bank. Uh, what can the gov uh, governor came out and announced the findings of the what, six out of the eleven decided that they're going to reduce something and this and that. But the, the whole idea of removing core macroeconomic decision policy making institutions out of democratic oversight was an underpinning of the neoliberal logic. It was explicitly stated that you need to remove them to avoid populism. So the idea that, for instance, you could direct the central bank. To put aside particular funds to support particular sectors of the economy is supposed to be gone out of the thing and this and that. And, and then, from our own view, for instance, is the dominant commitment to residual social policy and with consequences of persistence of mass entitlement failure. That you talk about poverty, you talk about what we call it, uh, uh, unemployment, you talk about poor housing. Um, I mean, in the post-1980, informal settlement across the continent has grown exponentially until before then. You need planning becomes an integral part. If you take your old Louisian model, two-sector uh, model, if you're going to move, what do you call it? What do you call it? People from the rural area to the urban area. A key thing immediately comes up. You have to plan in terms of housing, education, healthcare, and so on and so forth. All that is happening. So far, to say from Maputo. If you fly to Maputo, and uh, you know, if you fly to Cape Town, you see this in all the it's a recovery future, and so on and so forth. Final, final point. Um, policy of the future, for instance. I will argue that I can expression this on the discussions of the imperative of the reconstruction of the sort of southern national problems. And that requires a competence coalition of social forces 
that in the immediate time will require working class persons, middle class, what do you call it? Uh, you know, what we used to call national bourgeois class, a national bourgeois class in this short time. But it will require policy sovereignty. Uh, there was a clash between the Minister of Finance and the Public Protector. And the Minister of Finance argument about the Public Protector was that she's chasing away the investors. Not about, not about the value of what she was saying. She's carrying the, 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 with the investors. Uh, the whole Maritana thing comes down to the thing, the, the right of the investors, the anticipation of what the investors will do, takes precedence over citizenship. It's not something about the ANC. That's what I'm seeing here. The technology of the new people that we need to confront it that. There's the near-term project of economic and social reconstitution, constitution, which I, I would argue needs to be grounded on the norms of equality and solidarity. And governance grounded in what we call deliberative democracy and public wisdom. Traditionally, we refer to this thing as under the parliamentary. All of which, I will argue, requires the building the Pan African project and the project of political civilization. Thank you.